In today's video, I'm gonna answer some of your questions that I've been asked about my journey over the last couple of years in relation to this, YouTube, where I've gone from starting from scratch to having just hit 100,000 subscribers. The plan was to record this yesterday, Saturday, on a beach in Turkey, the last day of my holiday over there. I was also gonna talk about how the real secret to YouTube success is meticulous planning, paying attention to detail, and never losing focus of exactly where you wanna be and when. But when I woke up on Saturday morning, we discovered that our flight home had actually been on Friday night and we had two hours to vacate the hotel. So we then spent the day at the airport trying to arrange another flight home. So I think I'll just stick to answering the questions today. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. So on the flight to Turkey, about halfway there, 30,000 feet up, somewhere over Europe, 100,000 subscribers pinged up. It cost me five pounds for British Airways onboard Wi-Fi to see it happen, but worth every penny. And because I've been expecting the 100K, before I left home, I'd asked my Patreon members to ask me any questions that they might have about YouTube. Ideally, related to the YouTube aspects of being a fitness YouTuber, as opposed to the fitness bit. So hopefully, this will be interesting to anybody watching even if you aren't a regular here and into all the health and exercise stuff. So a 60 second background to the channel in case you are new. At the end of 2018, I set this all up because my kid, about 10 years old then, had said the 1100 views that he'd got on his channel were impressive. I knew nothing about YouTube or editing or social media, but I did know the chance of my kid creating something truly impressive was slim, so I bet him that I'd better get more views than that. I spent a fortune on all the gear I needed, I watched days and days of tutorials on here, learned how to make a video, and then uploaded a couple of films of me and my wife riding motorbikes around Africa. Crushed him, got at least 1,200 views eventually. I then did very little on here until the summer of 2019 when I started to film the exercise I was doing. I'd gone from very fat and out of shape in my mid 30s to now 48, not too bad. I talked about that, and then in 2020, it got more popular as I started to film my indoor cycling that I'd gotten into at a time when it was hugely popular due to lockdown. And things grew steadily-ish from there to here. Today, the channel now hopefully provides a down-to-earth take on health and fitness with some motivation and entertainment thrown in from the perspective of someone slightly different to a normal fitness YouTuber. And along with 100,000 subscribers, I have around 10 million views, and lately the growth has been growing exponentially. So it's running at around one and a half million views a month now. Okay, so bearing in mind I'm 100% self-taught over a relatively short space of time, which translates to still not entirely sure what I'm doing, and there are probably eight-year-olds out there videoing themselves, playing on an Xbox, getting more views in a week than I have total. It's question time, from the UK, with me, a moderately competent YouTuber highly incompetent international traveler. So how long does it take to edit a video and how many hours of content do you start with for each one? It depends. Theoretically, something simple like this video could be edited in a few hours. It's basically one long talking to camera piece. Something like my event videos, where I have multiple clips to link together and then fit alongside a commentary video perhaps, that can easily take all day. But what really increases the time is how much effort I wanna put in and typically, I like to do a good job. So that means simple stuff, just like cutting from one clip to the next is done accurately and flows nicely, almost invisibly. If I don't care too much about jumpy cuts and much, much of YouTube to YouTube, doesn't seem to, it will be far faster. It's also slowed down by the inclusion of extra layers of information or video that I might want to put on top of one another. So things that are sort of flying in and out of shot. Again, that adds to the video, but it adds significantly to the time. It can easily take a couple of full days working to edit together a longer, more complicated bit of content. And how much do I shoot? It can be as short as this one, where hopefully I'm gonna end up shooting probably twice as much as you end up seeing, due to allow for mistakes and stuff that I just decide to ditch, or as long as hours and hours of footage that I just don't use. Many times I've shot a couple of hours of stuff to end up using literally seconds of it. Equally, some stuff I've filmed gets used over and over again. <laughs> if you go back to the start and change anything, what would it be? Nothing. I am a big believer that if you are alive and well today, then everything that went before it could not have been that bad given many people are neither alive nor well. Going back and rolling the dice of life again is a pointless risk. It's easy to say, I should have done this, I should have made that video then. But in reality, those changes, they could have taken the channel in a very different direction that might not have been as positive. 
this is a stupid exaggeration, but it demonstrates my point. Should I have got in shape before I was heading towards 40? Maybe, but maybe I'd have been hit by a bus on the way to the gym at 32. Life is too random. Never re-roll unless you're under a bus. Bottom line, I am pleased with where the channel is today, and that means that everything that led here, good or bad, contributed. How many hours a week do you spend on the channel? Full-time job, no question. If I'm not filming something, I'm editing something, or I'm writing something, or I'm planning something, or I'm answering questions on Instagram or Facebook or comments on here, it is full-time. And my wife, Jenna, does a lot of helping out as well. I could cut corners, I could not bother answering questions or emails that I get sent, or I could edit videos a bit more roughly, but I would rather put in the extra time so I could leave in that barking dog, but I'm gonna go and shut him up and then refilm this bit. But I would rather put in the extra effort and time and do those things properly. And I enjoy it most importantly. So yeah, long hours, but lots of fun. What software do you use? Final Cut Pro X. When I started the channel, I knew nothing about YouTube or editing or filming. So I just Googled what the best software was that top YouTubers were all using and editing with. And I bought that and taught myself how to use it. Still am teaching myself all the time, watching videos on how to do stuff. I'm not naturally talented in the tech world. The other day I spent four hours solid trying to figure out how to get my Instagram post to automatically also post to my Facebook page. But the joys of YouTube is that there will be a tutorial video somewhere on it. What is your favorite or most used camera and accessory? Okay, it's not perfect, but the Sony a7 III that I'm using right now is pretty good for creating the bulk of the content. And the jump up to this 4K image was substantial compared to the Canon camera that I was using before. Uh, favorite accessory? Probably my teleprompter, which I'm literally reading now. It helps to remember what it is that I'm supposed to be saying, quite literally, and therefore makes editing way simpler as well because there's less, there's less mistakes to edit out, basically. Not to mention there are no ums and pauses and, uh, I don't know, just ums and ahs. It's all a bit slicker. How much as Patreon and sponsorship helped was it hard to obtain? Not hard once I got to about 50,000 subscribers. From then onwards to now, I'd get pretty much an offer once a week. Until then, I was getting offers, lots, but they were from companies that I just wouldn't want to be talking about on here. People just selling tat, mostly. I know how annoying it is to watch a video full of adverts and products, so I try and be particular while still making enough of a living to better actually make the content. Even now, I turn down thousands of pounds of sponsorship because it's just from companies that might well be fine, but I don't use their product. And if I'm mentioning something on here, it's gotta be because I rate it and I use it, not just because they're paying. Squarespace is a good example. I use them for my website and NordVPN, who are sponsoring this one. I use them, I like the service. So they pop up as sponsors sometimes. And does it help? Along with Patreon, it does, but actually not just because of the financial aspect. I get far more income from YouTube itself, but and this is particularly the case with Patreon, it's, it's to me, it's motivational. It's inspiring that people and companies want to support the channel. It helps massively with any sort of self-doubt issues I might have. It just makes me feel it's all working. If people are willing to say, I see value in what you're doing, and literally here's money to evidence that, that's just massively reassuring that I'm going in the right direction. By the way, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a sort of small community that you can subscribe to for a little bit of money each month, just in order to sort of support your favorite YouTuber. You get a bit of exclusive content. Uh, this week, mine on there is mostly this video before it goes public, and bikini shots, my wife from holiday. Link down below. Always be closing. Okay, what better time is there? Let's do it. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. I use NordVPN so that my system here is all running through their virtual private network, giving me heightened security and privacy. My internet service provider, or indeed anybody for that matter, can't see what I'm doing, what websites I'm visiting. They can't see my IP address. Everything is completely encrypted. So for example, my service provider can't do stuff like throttle back my streaming speeds. I also get to pick where in the world I appear to be. So if I want someone like Netflix to think that I'm in the States and provide me with the content that it only normally offers viewers over there, I just pick a location in the US. Equally last week in Turkey, I picked a UK location. So when I was doing a lot of internet shopping for the motorcycle gear that I'm gonna need because I've just bought a new motorbike, and trust me, that video is coming. Anyway, all the websites I was visiting thought I was in the UK based here, so it presented everything to me in pounds and pence. I also had no concerns about using the hotel Wi-Fi. No one can spy on my internet traffic. I'm doing online banking stuff. I had stuff I had to get done for work here. Doesn't matter. 
much higher levels of security with everything being encrypted. I run it on my Mac here, my laptop, my iPhone, and they all still run super fast. So use my link if you're interested, link down below, and NordVPN give a 30 day money back guarantee for peace of mind as well. As I say, I only ever talk about services and products that I use on here, this is one of them. 360 versus action camera. I've tried a few 360 options from GoPro, for example, the 360 Max and other brands as well. And I always come back to just using a standard GoPro Hero 10, for example, just so much easier to edit the footage with. And really, unless you're making clips of, I don't know, skydiving or skiing or something, most of the footage from this is just fine. Why is your wife never watching your videos? People think that one's weird, but actually, is it? She sees me all day long as it is anyway, and this is my job. It'd be like a TV newsreader going home to his wife and saying, hey, did you see me talking about that cat tree today that got rescued by the homeless guy? And she'd be like, no, do you want to come to my job tomorrow and watch me design widgets? Assuming she's a widget designer of some sort. Even friends and family. I don't really know if they watch the stuff all that much. I don't really discuss it with them. I mean, again, it's, it's my job. It's a job I love doing. If I'm going to the pub in the evening or something with mates, other than just saying, yeah, it's all going great, it doesn't really come up that much. How much time do you spend training every day? It depends entirely what I'm training for. Anything from nothing, I've just had three weeks off after my High Rocks competition, to a few hours a day. If I've got something specific in the diary, I basically train much more than most people, but nowhere near as much as a proper athlete, because I'm not. How do you go about organizing your day to get the best out of it? brutally efficient use of a diary that is shared with my wife and my kids as well so everybody knows where everybody is and when they have free time and when they don't. Every night before bed I look at my diary for the next day and I make sure that everything that needs doing is in there. Plan, plan, plan and in recent years that has proven to be an almost 100% successful way to just get everything done. Accidentally giving myself an extra day's holiday last week was an unusual error. What is the physical achievement you're most proud of beside your sub 20 minute 5k? I'm not sure actually, nothing stands out really. I don't really do pride in, in a sense in sports or this or anything really. If I set myself a target to achieve something and I achieve it, I kind of expect that to happen. So I'm satisfied more than anything. And if it doesn't happen, I'm probably annoyed. And that would be a bad reflection on my target setting if it happened too often. Unachievable targets are poor targets. I'm also a huge believer that everything comes down to a lot of luck really, where you're born, who your parents are, what your education is, uh, how healthy you are, it's luck. Even having, for example, the willpower to change your situation, if you have that, you're lucky you have that willpower. You don't choose how much willpower you get to have any more than I choose to be tall. You aren't better, you're lucky. So I'm glad I've achieved the things I have, I'm glad I had the willpower, for example, to get myself in shape but I'm not proud of it, which also leaves me much more empathy for others. There's a tendency in the fitness world, especially to look down on people that are out of shape as just not having enough desire to sort themselves out. The reality is, if you only had the levels of motivation they are able to summon up, you'd be in exactly the same place because you'd be them. Pet hate of mine is people looking at others struggling and saying, well, if I was them, no, stop. If you were them, you'd be them. Consider yourself lucky you're not. Did you ever feel like giving up? What was the reason you stuck at it? Yes, loads of times. From about 5,000 subscribers, where I first thought, hang on a minute, this might make a few pound every month, right the way through to probably January of this year, multiple times I decided to completely pack up, sell all my kit, sell all the video gear, stop wasting time and money on it. Full on, I can't keep doing this moments that I had over and over again. Gave up myself many, many times. Why did I stick with it? Jenna, my wife, she said, do not be a moron. You love doing it, so keep doing it. How can I help you? What do I need to do so you are free to work on it? This all exists entirely because of her support. And to link it back to the previous question, she never said, well, if it was me, blah, blah, blah. She just said, what do I need to do so that you, being you, can get to where you need to be? Run, cycle, or row. Running, you need nothing to do it. You can cross the country with it. You can escape zombies with it. I love it. Airwolf or A-Team? Airwolf. I always found A-Team a little bit childish. <music> Has the limited fame that you have experienced from your YouTube channel brought with it any downsides? Not really. In fact, the level of fame, if that's the right word, is pretty much perfect. High Rocks recently was a really good example. I wandered around in that huge arena in London, spent all day talking to people that approached me and Jen to say really nice things about the channel and what we're trying to do here. 
And I just love all of that. People apologize for disturbing us. Don't. Without people liking what I'm doing, there is no channel. But then when I leave and I go back into this real world, I'm nobody again. It's an absolutely perfect amount of fame. What was the point that you realized things had turned from a small fun hobby to something that could be sustainable as a job? So falling off my bike Christmas 2020 was when I realized that it could maybe make 200, maybe 300 pounds a month and be a hobby with a very tiny money bonus. Although that actually led to a lot of quitting moments for me because I was then working on it for hours and hours a day because it was doing okay and I wanted that to continue. But obviously that's not viable, two or 300 pounds a month. That doesn't work. It was a very tricky time. It was a hobby, making tiny hobby money, but costing full-time job commitment. Even my kids would joke that my hourly rate for YouTube was literally pennies. Then my I Rode 500 Days video made me think, hang on, this could make maybe a thousand pound a month sometimes. It might almost be viable as a hobby, sort of. Although even then, the hourly rate, it maybe moved up to a pound. It was a jump, but I was still under no illusion it made any real sense to keep going if it didn't increase. It wasn't really until this year and the Mo Farah video that I did that went over a million, I thought, okay, this might actually now pay like a job. The problem with talking about YouTube and making money is it just very much depends on so many factors as to whether any one person regards that as good or not. If you're a teenager and you're living at home and you're making videos with minimal equipment that you put a very small amount of effort into and then making a couple of thousand pounds every month, that might be brilliant. I mean, it certainly beats a paper round. But if you are a parent, grandparent, with a huge mortgage and people relying on me and another full-time job, and with thousands of pounds of equipment invested into YouTube, and it then taking a huge amount of time, all your time, the rewards just have to be bigger before it makes sense. Until a few months ago, a paper round would have made more sense. If you watch Rocky IV, do you skip over the bit when Apollo dies? No, but I watched the training montages twice over. Why did you decide to reduce the Zwift content? Right, so after this, I noticed that the Zwift stuff was way more popular than anything else that I was doing, so I started doing lots of it. But I equally knew there had to be a ceiling on the number of views I was gonna get for something that was, and it was popular, but it was ultimately still a bit niche. So I deliberately started to insert other video types in with the Zwift stuff, to sort of gently lead the Zwift folk into broader territory while picking up new subscribers in those other areas. One of the greatest compliments that I get now is when someone says, I subscribed for your cycling stuff or your running stuff, but I'm loving this video you're doing on high rocks or diet or something. That is always my goal, that any video on any topic is just entertaining enough for anybody from any background. What type of content do you enjoy doing more? Events, gear reviews, training, or motivational ones? I like to make a story, if possible, something with a start, a middle, and an end. So doing an event tends to lend itself to that very well. It's probably one that I enjoy most. The creative process around that is fun. But the motivational ones, talking to camera stuff, that's almost like being able to get sort of something off my chest, get thoughts out of my head and into the world. So they feel good to do as well. Gear reviews are okay. I don't want to waste anyone's time by featuring something on the channel that I don't enjoy using or don't use. So if I'm talking about something, it's probably something I do like. But even then, they tend to be a bit less creative. So they're probably bottom of the list. Out of those videos, what have done the best for you and have there been any videos that have really clicked and rocketed the growth? Gear reviews, ironically, people do like the Garmin stuff, uh, the Wahoo kicker bike things I did, they do bring subscribers in. And anything that is transformative, people seem to like as well, whether it's the 500 days off cycling video or the, the 10 year health transformation I went on, people like that, I was there and now I'm here sort of stuff. And when I feel a genuine transformation has taken place, they're fun to do as well. Three top must have or most useful bits of gear to help you get the content out. My teleprompter, my editing board, I only know how to use about 10% of it, but that 10% is very beneficial. And my incredibly supportive wife. How do you research a video idea? Where does the inspiration come from? Quite literally, I think, what do I fancy doing next? And then go have a go at it. There is a slight leaning towards things that will play well on here, but equally, there's a ton of stuff that I know I could do and get views on, but I would shoot myself in the head before I ever went near it. I have to like what I am making. And a lot of the time, the content just creates itself as well. So right now, Jen has just started working out to get fit from a poor starting point. An interesting journey that we're gonna be documenting on here. Last week on holiday, she sat by the sea looking in great shape. And we were discussing how people were gonna be saying, well, you're already fit then. And how do we combat that perception that looking a certain way doesn't necessarily 
correlate with fitness. So next week we're both off to get VO2 max tests done. Hopefully that will then form a video that will be informative, it's going to be interesting, hopefully have actually an important message behind it and be fun to do. Biggest piece of advice for an aspiring content creator on YouTube. Right, so this is an artistic creative endeavour, it's a bit like being an actor or a musician, but with zero barrier to entry. If you're a bad musician, people aren't going to let you get up on stage at their venue and perform. YouTube will let any moron have a go at this. And consequently, there are millions of people doing just that, and an awful lot of people making a living off of YouTube, telling those people how they can just keep plugging away at it, and eventually it will all become good and they'll be YouTube millionaires. The reality is, most clearly will not. So set yourself sensible targets to achieve and use to assess whether you are truly making progress and if not work out why. In the new YouTuber forums online there's a real sense among a lot of people that if you just keep plugging away, churning out videos, you'll make it. Will you? No one's telling people that can't play two chords of the guitar, just keep strumming, that record contract's around the corner. They say go home and learn how to play the guitar. So don't mistake no barrier to entry to don't need to be any good. My videos are about fitness and health, for example, which is something I spent a huge part of my life working on. They're quite funny, hopefully. I spent hours and hours in grotty pubs doing stand-up comedy to hopefully get okay at being funny. And I wanted them well edited, so I spend time and money on making sure that I'm sufficiently competent to do that. So metaphorically, I'm stood on stage able to play something at least a little bit. So yeah, when I hear people say, I want to do YouTube, and I say, do what on YouTube? And they're, I don't know, I just want to do YouTube. I don't know what that is. I know many people learned as they went on YouTube and sort of found what they wanted to do with it as they went along, but for every Mr. Beast, there's probably a million Mr. Rubbish who would have just been better off if they'd approached it as a creative art, a little bit more traditionally, like having a skill beyond just hitting upload. Actually, on the flip side, what I see a lot of is people that do do something that's incredibly interesting or very skilled at, and it hasn't even occurred to them to showcase that on here. Those people I am always telling, invest a weekend watching how to make a video and then stick something up. Do you have problems with other runners when they notice you are filming or even race organisers? No, somebody with a GoPro is just a common thing at any event from a park run to London Marathon. And if people do recognise me from here, they often quite like the idea they might actually end up featuring on a video. And most race organisers are fine, in fact the sensible ones love that they're going to be on here because it gets them more people going along and attending their event, so accordingly most of them are really appreciative. Oddly, the only problem I've ever had with any of them is my local park run who, when they featured in a video that I'd done that had a few hundred thousand views, I said to them, if you guys want to use this in your marketing, do so, and initially they said, yeah, please. Then they decided that it breached their filming regulations and that I should have gone along and told the race director first that I'd be there. Tell them what? That I'm in a public park with a GoPro and saying great things about them? Unless that park's in North Korea? I don't think so. If you're aiming for an informative educational channel, how do you battle the Gymshark effect of everybody preferring crap advice and fad diets from hot girls in sports bras versus good advice from a middle-aged man with his shirt on? A. Gratuitous use of my wife. Jim Shark, if you are listening, she would love a sports bra from you guys. B, as much as possible, I ignore that world. If I let myself get sucked into that whole, I trained like this actor for 10 minutes, or I ate 10 pizzas for breakfast, and here's what happened stuff, I just wouldn't be very happy with what I was making. I have nothing against that sort of content, it just doesn't tick my box. I guess it's the same as being a small indie filmmaker, trying to make awesome movies, and then you see that every superhero CGI fest just blows everything away. It is what it is. I'm happy with what I make and the reasons why I make it, that's enough for me. Having said that, and joking aside, I'm not against using what does sell, even if some content makers take what sells and then can't resist going too far and turning it up to 12. So Jenna, being part of the channel is a calculated, considered decision, as well as being something that we will enjoy doing and hopefully people will enjoy watching. Equally, it's in context, the shirt comes off. How do you feel with somebody who has built a good career financial security before moving into YouTube about people avoiding university and further education to try and be a full-time YouTuber from the outset? Well, I'm all for people getting out of formal education whenever they think it's right for them. I left school at 16 and no employer has ever asked to see any qualification that I ever got at school. I might as well have not bothered going and I hated every second of it anyway. Don't, don't.
none of my kids have gone to uni either. The youngest one might go, I suppose, in a couple of years' time, but he knows the score. Doctor, lawyer, engineer, I'll pay. Otherwise, you better have saved up a lot of paper our money. But the I'm going to be a YouTuber thing, I mean, if you have something worthy of presentation on YouTube, then it doesn't matter if you're 16 or 60, present it, and YouTube is brilliant for that. I guess it goes back to my earlier point about just YouTubers in general. You really need to bring something to the table, I think. What has been the biggest adjustment in the transition from a wealth management professional and hobby fitness enthusiast to full-time YouTuber and fitness enthusiast? The biggest adjustment is the slightly surreal switch to now doing lots and lots of work and putting lots and lots of effort into something that I love doing and get a real sense of creative satisfaction from producing and have the added motivation to work out on top. My other job was fine and incredibly good to me in all sorts of ways, but this is just fun, enjoyable, exciting. It's an adjustment, it's just not a bad one. What's your go-to donut? A donut time vegan Hasselhoff. What makes you decide on the length of your videos? 10 to 15 minutes, feels quite short, but okay. 15 to 25, feels spot on. And 25 to 35 minutes feels like it's getting long, but maybe doable. So those are my bands based on nothing other than gut feel. And then I typically find it just takes me about 23, 24 minutes to tell a story, whatever the subject is, to just get from the setup deal with it, conclude it, that arc just flows well over 20 to 25 minutes. It's probably why most TV sitcoms are 25 minutes long. How much do you script your videos or do you just start with an initial idea and then do most of it while improvising? I script almost every word. If I'm sat here, every word. What does that look like? Well, remember that bit from before? Looks like this. Not to mention there are no ums and pauses and uh, I don't know just ums and ahs it's all a bit slicker scripted the same as almost every movie tv show song stand-up comic I find it's the only way for me to construct a video in a way that gives it a satisfying start middle and end it includes all the points I want to make uh, to make sure it's funny enough entertaining enough and to make sure that things like references or jokes that happen later on can call back and refer to something from earlier I can't think of a good example right now, but something that just ties it all together. If you went and watched a movie and it felt like they just made it up as they went, nine times out of ten, you'd think that movie sucked. For me, this is no different. I know I could roll out of bed with the GoPro and just ramble at you while I'm making coffee and a protein pancake and then go and train up the rock, but I'd rather just start with something that I've given some actual thought to and practiced practice delivering it so it's as good as it can be. And importantly, that doesn't mean it has to sound artificial. Everything that I'm saying to you now, I would have just rambled off into my iMac dictation app last week on holiday and then spent a few days reading it. Does it make sense? Does it need to be tighter? Could I have said something in just a more entertaining way? So it's still natural conversation, it's just turned up to 11. And a good example of what I was just saying about callbacks, which was all scripted. You seem to know a lot about sports nutrition and healthy food. Any plans to do a video in which you share your favorite recipes? I don't really do recipes. Um, I'm vegan, which means that what I eat would appeal to a minority of people. Actually, no, what I eat would appeal to the majority of people, but then they would miss what I exclude. I also couldn't care less what anybody else eats, so I have no motivation to use food-based videos on here to push any sort of uh, plant-based agenda. Every now and then, I suppose I do a video that does feature food because clearly it's, it's relevant, it's part of my health and fitness. But yeah, just not saying that I'm really that into. Jenna is though, and because she's gonna be on the channel more this year with her training and stuff uh, and clickbait photos, she might do one, I guess, in a bikini, cooking lentils. I seem to remember one of your early videos. You said that you weren't too worried about using classic film clips as hardly anybody was watching and no copyright owner would care. Now with your newfound fame, are you having to choose or edit the clips differently to avoid getting pinged? So very simple, the bottom line is the only way to be 100% safe is only use content you create yourself. But I like to use clips from classic films, so I roll the dice. Stuff will only get picked up by YouTube's automated system if it's a substantial clip that it can easily detect. I rarely use clips that last more than a fraction of a second, so I tend to dodge that. Dodge this. My real exposure is to the owner of those clips, some big movie studio, I guess, actually seeing my video and then having a problem with my use of their clip. And there's all sorts of guides out there as to what you're likely to get away with and on what basis you could argue it's fair use. But at the end of the day, it just comes down to being sensible. If I say dodge, I would use a fraction of a second of the matrix, how impacted is the box office revenue for that film that's over 20 years old going to be? Have I portrayed it in a content that's negative? If you're the owner of that content, 
quite simply, would you have a problem with my 0.4 seconds use of it in a joke context? Keanu seems like a nice guy, I think he'd be okay. I'm interested in how your swimming is going, is the reason that there aren't any swimming videos that you hate swimming, or is it too much of a hassle? I do hate swimming. I have a huge shark phobia that is significant in swimming pools and crippling in the sea. It took me 20 minutes to dive in here because I kept seeing shadows under the water. And yeah, it's also a nightmare to film swimming in a pool because quite rightly, it's not allowed in most pools. Having said that, I've just got some new cool goggles with a head up display in them. So it's possible that my love of tech will overcome my hatred of great whites. Watch this space. So then I think that is it. I hope that was useful, bit of a change from the normal sort of content, but that is back in the next video, which is gonna be on Zwift, and then we'll have those VO2 max tests coming next week. So subscribe if you've not already done so. The next big milestone for subscribers is 1 million, and I'm 48, so we really do need to crack on. Oh, and I'll put that Patreon link down below as well, just in case. <laughs> <laughs>